This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello, Jenny Murray welcoming you to the Women's Hour podcast on Wednesday the 15th of May. In today's programme, The Little Girl on the Ice Flow, the memoir of a French woman whose life was dominated by the rape she suffered at the age of nine and the impact of her attacker finally being found. And as part of the BBC's mental health season, living with what used to be called manic depression and is now known as bipolar disorder. I very much doubt you've missed the fact that the new Sunday night serial on BBC One is to be Gentleman Jack. It's been advertised everywhere. Sir Ron Jones is to play Anne Lister, who was a Halifax landowner and industrialist in the early 19th century. She lived at Shipton Hall, which is where the copious diaries she wrote were hidden and were only found in the late 1930s to reveal an extraordinary life. Lister had travelled widely, inherited the house and the business, was fearless in her choice of dress, wearing clothes more suited to a man than a woman in her time, and she wrote openly about her love for women. The more racy parts of the diary were written in code. In the first episode to be shown on Sunday, we find Anne in bed with her married lover, Mariana Lawton, who's just suggested Anne's life would be easier if she got married. No one knows you better than I do. Then you do know that I could never marry a man. For any reason, under any circumstance, it would be perverse. It would be absurd. But the reality is that you I thoroughly intend to live with someone I love. I thoroughly intend to spend my evening hour with someone who loves me. Someone who is there all of the time to share everything with. Not someone who just drops him every now and then whenever an irritable husband permits it. And the reality is that that will never happen. This is what you can't see. And until you do, you're going to keep on getting into scrapes with women like Via Hobart, and you're going to keep getting upset when they get married, which they will. Lydia Leonard and Saran Jones. Now, Anne Choma, who joins us from Leeds, is the author of Gentleman Jack, The Real Anne Lister, and Sally Wainwright has written the television series. Sally, how did you come to hear of Anne Lister? Well... I grew up in Halifax, as you know, um, and I always visited Shibden Hall as a child. It was somewhere you were taken by my parents and on school trips. And it was somewhere I was always um, mesmerised by. It's a beautiful, magical place. And I, I always felt a real attachment to it, but I didn't know anything about Anne Lister. I only discovered Anne Lister, really, when I read Jill Liddington's book, Female Fortune, which was published in 1998. And I was just amazed that, this extraordinary woman had owned this house that I'd always felt this um, real, uh, you know, connection and affection for. Um, I'd started to pick up during the 90s that somebody extraordinary had owned Shibden, this woman who was transgressive, there was something interesting about her, but it was really hard to find out much about her up until I read Jill's book. And then retrospectively, I read the Helena Whitbread's work, which she'd published in the 1980s. Um, but, you know, we're only really now starting to figure out who this fantastic woman was. Now, Anne, how did you become interested in her? Um, similar story, really, actually, Jenny, to Sally's. But um, I'm from Leeds, I'm not from Halifax. And uh, so I didn't go to Shibden Hall as a child. I wished I had done. Um, but... Uh, Similar to Sally, I was given a book um, by a friend and it was Helen Whitbread's uh, book of extracts called I Know My Own Heart. And that set me on my way to doing a university degree at uh, Leeds University. And uh, I did a master's degree and a thesis on Anne's diaries. So that was my initial interest. And that's when I started going to the uh, archives and transcribing the diaries and looking at the letters myself and the vast Lister archive that's there. Sally, how would you describe Anne? There's, there's almost too much to say about Anne. You, you kind of, you kind of get, you get. It's, it's where we're to gonna start. We're going to be here all morning, aren't we? She was an extraordinary human being. She was, I mean, she's known to us primarily, primarily as a prolific lesbian diarist. But when you get to know, her, as I have done over the last twenty years, the, the thing that jumps out at you most is just how clever she was. She was a phenomenally intelligent woman. She was remarkably physically fit. Uh, she was a polymath. She, she. Uh, was a great traveller, a great scholar. She was a great linguist. She became an industrialist. She sank her own coal mines. I mean, she she studied the engineering behind coal mining. She didn't just um, uh, pay other people to do it. Um, 
one of the really fascinating things about her for me is that she, people have said, oh, she was rich. She could do all these things because she was rich. She wasn't rich. She, she'd been always quite a modest estate and she had to make it pay. She was always uh, struggling uh, to find the next five pounds, where the next five, you know, the next uh, hit of money would come from. Um, the other great thing I love about her more than anything is she had such a positive attitude to life for her life was for living she had this brilliantly curious mind and she was always doing about 10 things at once she was she was a, a real force of nature and she, she's really inspiring in that sense and there were an awful lot of diaries that she'd written over the years what's the story of how they came to be hidden then found and then the code translated Oh, gosh, uh, that is a question, Jenny. Um, In a nutshell, uh, they were found behind um, a panel at Shibden Hall by the last ancestor of Shibden Hall, the last uh, inhabitant called John Lister. And um, he discovered the journals behind a panel and um, with his friend Arthur Burrell uh, set about trying to crack the code. Um, They eventually did do that and uh, discovered what the code, the contents of the code was. And... uh, as soon as they realised uh, that it contained sexual content of love between women, uh, the diaries were hastily put back behind the panel. And in fact, um, Arthur Burrell, um, John Lister's learned friend, um, he wanted John Lister to burn the diaries, but he refused and he recognised the value of this amazing document uh, of Anne Lister's life. So, uh, Sally, why would you say her writing about her lesbian relationships is so significant because she did code it. It's significant because it's the first time, um, it's the it's the first record that lesbian relationships existed between women. It's the, it's the only record of that level of, fec- of affection between women um, because it was never illegal. It was be- it was beneath illegal. It was illegal for men, and so there are court records that men had sexual relationships. But because it was not illegal for women, there's there's not even court records. So when, um, you know, it was revealed what was in the code, it's it's the only record that that level of intimacy actually existed between women. And who were her lovers and, and how open was she about what was going on? I know the writing was coded, but people must have known. Yeah, I mean, they, they did know. Her first lover was um, Eliza Rain, who she met at the Manor House boarding school as a, as a teenager in York. And um, and from then on, she had um, subsequent relationships with Mariana Lawton, who was the main love of her life, really. And then um, Isabella Norcliffe before that. So she had various lovers in her life, not as many as people like to think she had. I mean, I you know, I, you sometimes read that she had scores of lovers, but she didn't in actual fact. You could actually count on one hand the significant uh, lovers that she did have. Um, she never veered from who she was and she stood proud, you know, against a world that was often cruel about the way she looked. But she did, you know, she was careful enough to exercise and behave in a way that didn't um, countenance any kind of uh, bad thoughts about her or, or um, you know, she she was very, very careful to exercise discretion and she she actually behaved in a very discreet manner with the women that she was with. But uh, Sally, as a fellow Yorkshire woman, I mean, oh. we're all three of us Yorkshire women, as was Anne, how surprised were you to find someone with the courage to live her life so boldly in Halifax? It, she was extraordinarily courageous. I mean, she had she had the heart of a lion. Um, she she was very singular. She had she 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 was able to live life by her own standards in uh, against all convention. I mean, she she must have been a very unusual human being to have met. Um, she was very charismatic. She and again, it, she she was very clever. And I think um, she she had to live life on her own terms because of her intellect. I think there were, there were very there, she probably met very few people who were quite on her intellectual level. But what what impact did learning about her have on your understanding of the history of Yorkshire, your home county? It it changed my attitude. I mean, I've always been a keen historian. I've always loved history. I've always been passionate about the past. Um, but it, it certainly changed my attitude towards my hometown. I mean, I grew up uh, 
as a teenager who wanted to work in telly, so I couldn't wait to leave. I wanted to go and live in London because I thought that's where it all happened. And then when I discovered Anne Lister, my hometown suddenly became magical to me in a way that I could never have anticipated. And how did she view her gender? Because I know she was often mistaken for a man and she certainly dressed in a very masculine way, not particularly acceptable at that time. Um, yeah, she was misgendered a lot. And I think I write in the book that she, you know, once when she was travelling through um, France, that she was mistaken for a man three times in one day. Um, I mean, what makes her, what makes Anne Lister really modern is that she was debating notions of gender fluidity 200 years before anybody else was doing it. So she would often write in her diary, um, she'd write something like, you know, she was neither man nor woman in society, or she was like, she'd see herself as like a connecting link. So um, I think she had a very, very, very healthy self-esteem about who she was, but she was having these these debates within herself. And in that first episode, which I, which I've seen, she's very angry at the thought that women might not get the vote. Um, she's. Uh it's interesting that she she's she, she wasn't a great exponent of women's rights you know that was, just wasn't a discourse at the time she was interested in her own rights primarily but when they're talking about the reform bill she she is cross in that first episode that yeah she's quite sarcastic about um, the way the world is she is <laughs> now, you say in your book Anne that she inherited Chibden Hall because she was a lesbian why do you say that I think I've kind of um, pushed the boundaries there and I wanted to be a bit brave about what I was saying because I think um, Anne Lister and her uncle James and her aunt Anne, they had a very, very unique, groundbreaking relationship with each other. And I think my understanding is that they had a tacit understanding of who she was and what her sexuality was. So I believe that... Uncle James had a great understanding of her lesbian sexuality that, in fact, they had conversations with each other and she'd say, you know, I'm never going to marry. And he said, yes, I understand that. Um, and she would often say things in the diaries like, you know, if I was, a, so, if I was other than I was, I wouldn't have got the estate. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I kind of pushed the, you know, I, I pushed myself in the book because I wanted to be to come down and say that, Aunt Anne and Uncle James were very, very understanding of who she was and that there was nobody else really there that could have inherited the estate. Sally, Saran Jones plays Anne, and I know you worked with her on Scott and Bailey. Mm. Why did you think she would be the right person for the part? Well, it, to, to begin with, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine who could be Anne because there's just so much to her. There's so many facets to her character. It was really hard to... Which is, diff, is unusual for me. Normally, I have someone in mind. Um... And I think initially I imagined Saran is, she's a very, you know, a very contemporary looking woman. And I think that was partly why to begin with, my mind hadn't gone to her. And in fact, ultimately, that was the thing that's made the performance most exciting, that she does have this very contemporary quality. I think what Saran's got in common with Anne Lister hugely is a physical energy, a mental brilliance. I mean, Saran has ideas popping out of her head all the time. And um, we, we were... So the, the, there are some really obvious, uh, and she's very charismatic, of course. She's very, um, uh, um, you know, she's got this huge personality, and that's so unlister. Now, we since we last spoke, you made to walk invisible about the Bronte mm. sisters. What other northern women are you going to bring to the screen? Well, um, I've just um, got very interested in Amy Johnson, who came from Hull. Uh, the aviatrix Amy Johnson, who had a very extraordinary life. And um, so uh, that's <laughs> what I'm hoping to look at next. Fine by me. I love you bringing all these northern <laughs> women out. Sally Wainwright and Anne Germa, thank you very much indeed, both of you, for talking to us this morning. Um, and a reminder that the new series starts this Sunday evening. Uh, and I've seen one episode. It's well worth watching. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you.